Good evening. Tonight, as a special pre-Christmas program, we go after the story of a child prodigy, one of the biggest money winners in television quiz show history. He's 12-year-old Lenny Ross, the California schoolboy who won a total of $164,000 on the big surprise and the $64,000 challenge with his amazing knowledge of the stock market. Lenny, in a moment I shall ask you what you think of quiz shows, eggheads, President Eisenhower, American Education, and Santa Claus. My name is Mike Wallace. The cigarette is Philip Morris. Philip Morris, the natural smoke with a man's kind of mildness, presents... The Mike Wallace Interview. We'll talk with Lenny Ross in just a minute. I'll bet there are smokers on your Christmas list who would welcome a gift carton like this. This handsome package of today's Philip Morris contains 200 smokes with a man's kind of mildness. 200 smokes that taste just right. Because, you see, there's a straightforward character to this cigarette, and yet there's mildness here, too. Genuine mildness. No filter, no fooling, no artificial mildness. And that's the reason I like today's Philip Morris. That's why... I'll be giving cartons of Philip Morris like this one, and I hope you will too. And during the holidays, if company's coming to your house, it might be a good idea to have some smokes on hand for them to enjoy, so pick up a few extra cartons. I'm sure any smoker will appreciate the man's kind of mildness in this cigarette. Today's Philip Morris. And now to our story. In recent years, America has found a new set of heroes, quiz contestants like Teddy Nadler, Charles Van Doren, and 12-year-old Lenny Ross. Now that Russian Sputniks are whirling above our heads, it's generally agreed that America needs more youngsters like young Leonard Ross. Tonight, we'll try to find out what he thinks of his problems and of ours. Lenny, first of all, let me ask you this. You've made $164,000 answering questions. How does it feel to be doing it for free? I think I enjoy it. Uh, I'll wait until the end of the program before I can say for sure. All right, I'll ask you that question again later. Last week, Lenny, the United Press asked one of the original radio quiz kids, actress Vanessa Brown, why she refused to appear on TV quiz shows. And she said, because I want to be an actress, not an oddity. To appear in a quiz show, she said, there's no trick to it at all. It's a matter of collecting and saving facts like some people collect money. How do you feel about that? The quiz shows are entertainment, like the Mike Wallace interview. And, uh... I, uh, certainly a lot of the questions asked deal with facts which are not too useful, but not everything is useful. Certainly there are a number of things that a person acquires, uh, material things and information, which have no actual use. And I think the quiz show is uh, an entertainment based on the fact that some people have accumulated uh, specialized knowledge of a, of a subject, you don't feel, then, that you were a freak or an oddity when you answered stock market questions that might have stopped, uh, stumped, as a matter of fact, uh, did stump uh, veteran stockbrokers. You didn't feel like a... A stockbroker is not in the business of acquiring facts about the stock market, uh, which stocks pay dividends in a certain year. Uh, however, if, you're, if somebody is not in the business and has a side interest, it's perfectly normal to acquire such facts. And thus you won't find a professional knowing them, and that's natural. Well, is it possible that you just have a freak memory? For instance, Charles Van Doren said in the September 23rd Life magazine, Lenny, he said about his own triumphs, I'm afraid that the knowledge that quiz show contestants exhibit is hardly more than junk, he said. He said, I have an odd memory. I find it difficult to forget things. Could it be that you too, Lenny, just have kind of a, a freak memory? Or, uh, or do you feel that... You and he and Nadler and people like you who win on quiz shows are rather extraordinary persons who are extraordinarily gifted uh, in an overall sense. Well, as for myself, I wish I did have a freak memory. It could certainly help me in school. But uh, I don't consider myself extraordinarily gifted, as you term it. And I don't know about uh, Mr. Nadler or Mr. Van Dorn, because I'm not the... Uh, I think it's an interest that I've developed, and mainly two subjects, the stock market and politics, and I've acquired 
a fair amount of information, no more than has interested me on these subjects, and I'm interested in it. Mm -hmm. Are and you thinking, perchance, of going on a quiz show in the category of politics sometime in the future, Lynn? I wouldn't mind. You feel that you know enough about politics? American politics now we're talking about? Yes, American politics. And that it's possible that you know enough to go uh, on a quiz show in that category? I, I don't know exactly the extent of my information. I have the interest, mm -hmm. which is necessary. What about the effects on the youngster of your age appearing on a network quiz show? Actor David Wayne said this in the New York Sunday News back in January 20th of this year. He said, we, meaning his wife and he, we definitely wouldn't want our children to appear on a TV quiz program. And his reasons were these. He said, the heavy pressure built up on these shows and the publicity that might prevent them, the children that is, from leading the normal carefree existence of the average child. Now, do you think that your appearances on the big surprise, the $64,000 challenge, have prevented you from leading a normal life? What is this normal child they're talking about? Is it so wonderfully normal not to have an interest in a special subject? I can't see that viewpoint. And this idea of being carefree, I don't think I've developed any ulcers. And I don't think I've been uh, harmed in any way by it. Lenny, I remember when you and I were doing the big surprise. I was the quiz master on the big surprise at the time that you won your mm -hmm. $100,000. And there was, there was one New York newspaper man in particular, J. Nelson Tuck, who said at some length and with a good deal of bitterness that he felt that it was very wrong for the producers of the show in general and for me in particular to be putting that special pressure on you. Now, do you... Uh, seriously, did you feel a considerable pressure, a considerable amount of worry as the uh, amounts uh, got larger and larger for which you were going? I think my worry, <coughs> excuse me, decreased as the amounts got larger and larger. My main consuming worry when I got to New York was that I'd miss on the first question. Mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, I have a little cold. Uh, I, I don't think I was under any special strain. If I was, and uh, there was a lot of strain in learning the material and making sure that I knew what I thought would be necessary. Yes. But I don't think uh, it had any effects after the program. What has changed for you? My bank account. That's it? That's about it. Truly, you feel that you are just the same kind of fellow, Leonard Ross, that you were uh, three years ago before you got involved, or however long ago it was before you got involved in quiz shows. Uh, what I mean is this. Studying the stock market at the age of seven, which is, I believe, the time that you told me that you had started really That's to study correct. the stock market. You were also active in meetings and campaigns of the Democratic Party. Since which, that age. Since that age. You go to school with boys several years older than yourself. Now, this isn't a result of quiz shows, but this is a result of your intellectual activity. Does this lead to the carefree existence of childhood that is supposed to be so precious? That's what I mean when I say normal childhood. Well, I don't agree that the carefree existence is this is what is is so precious. I mean, uh, I I don't go around worrying. I have very few worries. Uh, when I have trouble in my schoolwork, I'm not worrying. I'm trying to study to catch up, mm -hmm. as I'm currently having trouble in uh, science. Mm -hmm. uh, the carefree existence mainly means that the entire time of every child should be spent uh, playing with dolls or toy trucks or something which will not uh, affect the mind so as to uh, expose any child to uh, uh, any mental stress. Now, I think this is wrong. And you brought up Sputnik, and I, I hate to uh, just say something for the sake of the times, but if we want scientists, the way, the way to produce them is not to tell everybody under 18 or 16 or 14 to play dolls. Well, now, wait just a second. We're not talking exclusively about dolls. You're 12 years old now, Lynn. Do you play ball much? Do you have many friends? What, what I'm trying to find out is this. Who, not specifically, but what kind of people are your friends? Has your intellectual activity, has your studying and your preoccupation with things that are, let's say, a little bit different from that which preoccupies most children, has it made you kind of a different person, and perhaps even a lonely young fellow? Well, first of all, I'd like to, to have your definition of the term friend. I mean, I'm not saying this just for the point of argument. Uh, I, I want to know exactly what you mean so I can answer it fairly. All right. Who do you spend your afternoons with? 
Who, wh what do you do on Saturdays and Sundays? Do you call fo fellas on the phone and uh, go down to the corner and play ball? Do you go to the movies with them? Do you belong to a scout troop uh, with them? Do you exchange, let's say, collect stamps together? I'm just trying to think back to some okay. of the things that I did and uh, that I figure that possibly, Lenny, you don't have an opportunity to do. I get up at 6.30 in the morning and I have breakfast. I'm through with school at 1.13. I get home 1.30. I study until about 3.30. And for the rest of the day, I either read a little bit on serious matters, or read a mystery, or relax. This semester, and I'm speaking of this semester only, I do not spend too much time. I spend a, a lot of time relaxing. I have more leisure than I certainly need. And I'm trying to uh, eliminate some of it because uh, I'm not using my time to fullest advantage. But this semester, instead of going to the movies, I may read a mystery. Mm -hmm. And this isn't because I'm antisocial or anything. I've had quite a few friends previously. It's because my schedule has changed. Well, momentarily, then, you don't have very many companions your own age or, or older? That's right, and I see no necessity to have them. There's nothing wrong with it, but I don't think it's mandatory. Mm-hmm. Leonard, have you ever heard of Professor Norbert Wiener? Yes, and uh, I think I read part of his uh, book. His autobiography called Ex Prodigy? Uh -huh. My father read part of it uh, aloud and chose an excerpt. Oh, you smile. Why do you smile about it? Well, uh, he's... Uh, uh, all of the members of our family are continually pestering every other member of the family with chosen excerpts of the book or magazine we're reading. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, he, I believe, entered high school at the age of nine. I... Uh, I believe I so. And he wrote as follows. He said, the seats were much too big for me. My adolescent fellow students seemed to me already full adults. My classmates viewed me socially as an eccentric child. And this obviously caused him some pain. At least that's what we gathered from what he wrote. Now you, I wonder if you go through any of these experiences like his. I gather from what you say that you don't. Well, I, if I'm viewed as an eccentric, I don't know it. If I am, it doesn't bother me. Because I don't consider myself an eccentric. I think uh, I am interested in certain subjects which are uh, of importance and a good use of my time. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying at least part of the day, and m much less than I'd like to, because I spend far too much time relaxing, uh, to spend my time to improve myself intellectually. Is and I can see nothing wrong with it. Oh, I'm not suggesting for an instant that there's anything wrong with it. I'm just trying to find out a little bit about you, Lenny. Uh, is it possible that this is something that you've arrived at, in a sense, through bitter experience? The reason I say that is this. The New York Journal American wrote about you last year. It said that when you were in kindergarten, your classmates on at least one occasion nearly made you cry by calling you a dope and saying, you talk funny. They didn't seem to understand you. Did that bother you then more than it does now, and have you uh, kind of figured it out for yourself by now? Well, since the third grade, this has not happened in any class which I've been in. Uh, for quite a few kids who are not in my class, and this is, I, I think this is substantially correct, mm -hmm. uh, need something to do, so they uh, make nasty remarks at, about, at almost everybody who doesn't please them, and this doesn't bother me at all, nor does it bother anybody else. Mm. Uh, Professor Weiner puts his finger on what may be an important problem. Half humorously and half seriously, he wrote this. He said, there's a tradition not confined to the United States, that the child who makes an early start is doomed to an early collapse and permanent second-ratedness. And both your mother and your former school principal commented on this problem. Uh, your mother is quoted as saying, I can't help worrying a little bit about him. So many children like him have come to really miserable ends. Well, there's been a lot of publicity about this. But the only time I heard the theory really uh, expounded fully was at a drugstore across from CBS, no, <laughs> in Los Angeles. Perfectly all right. <laughs> we acknowledge are. their existence, uh, Lenny. Fine. <laughs> uh, I, some woman came up to me while we were eating and said, y you will die an idiot, or something like that. She came up to you and said that? Yes. Yes, and what did you say back? Nothing. She walked away. I mean, there are plenty of fanatics around Los Angeles. <laughs> you, <laughs> you don't feel that you're going to die an idiot, or that not. you're doomed to permanent second-ratedness. Tell me, uh, and this, 
Well, do you feel that Americans as a whole either are jealous of or suspicious of intellect, either in youngsters or in older people, more mature people as well? Well, I think a percentage of Americans are. I don't think this is a, a national thing. But uh, one thing that particularly uh, annoys me is that this in Sputnik, and I see it in, in the paper every day, and I think that's a good thing. But I've never heard, and I'm speaking just figuratively, of a pep rally or a victory flag or a song for a, a person in school who got a scholarship. But if he happens to be a football player, uh, this is done. Now, I think, I don't think there's overemphasis on football except comparatively to scholarship. And I think this is a poor thing. I think, uh, Scholarship is being discouraged quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Not officially, but unofficially uh, by quite a few kids, N not most. You're a freshman in high school now? I'm in the 10th year, yeah. A of school. 10th year, so that, then you're... They're 12. Yes, yeah, so you're a sophomore actually in high school now. Well, uh, we're on a three-year high school basis in oh, Los Angeles. What do you think, from what you've been able to see of it up to now, what do you think of American high school education? Why, I am uh, very happy with my school, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement. This semester, I have no complaints. I'm working as hard as I can, and I'm trying to keep up with my classes. I'm taking several new subjects. I gather you're having trouble with science. With chemistry. I did all right for the first ten weeks, and I've had a little trouble. Since of course, there's a good deal of concern here about the strayed, uh, strides in science uh, being made in Russia. The American newspaper publisher, William Randolph Hearst, Jr., just returned from a trip to Russia and wrote that in elementary schools there, the fifth grade child finds algebra and physics on the curriculum, and he is, is indoctrinated in the glories of winning a scholarship. That's a direct quote from Mr. Hearst. And if he passes exams admitting him to high school, says Mr. Hearst, he becomes part of a special breed, this is a quote, that feels with some justification that the world is his oyster. That does well, not stack up with your experience, I gather, in your own high school. We can have the benefits of uh, advanced education, which I certainly think is necessary, without uh, necessarily transforming us into a Soviet Union type of uh, atmosphere. Uh, I think that there is everything to be gained and very little to be lost with, uh, in offering algebra and physics to confident fifth graders or second graders or two-month-old babies. If they can do it, fine. And this is one trouble I've had quite a bit. Not now, but recently, uh, several years ago. You mean of the, of the uh, school being too slow for you? No. Uh, I, there are advanced courses, but I wasn't permitted to take them. Not because I couldn't pass the examination, uh, require, uh, the prerequisites, but because I was too young, they felt I might be socially maladjusted uh -huh. because I, I couldn't stay at a, a lower level in one subject. I think this is incorrect. Lenny, I know that you're an ardent Democrat. You attend meetings, pay dues, distribute campaign literature. What is it about the Democratic Party that attracts you rather than the Republican Party? Well, I like to consider myself a liberal, and I know that's a, a very broad term. So I, I'll, I'll use it and uh, just... Uh, use the regular uh, usage of the term. Mm -hmm. But the, the only sizable liberal contingent in any party, including the Prohibitionist Party, is, the, uh, is in the Democratic Party. I don't think there is any uh, liberal influence of great extent in the Republican Party. Don't you think the new party. Republicans at all are liberal? Don't you think perhaps that Mr. Eisenhower and particularly lately Mr. Nixon are showing definite liberal tendencies? No, I think the New Republicans are too liberals. And I think New Republicanism is only, uh, only came about after 20 years of defeat uh, at the hands of the New Deal. I see. And it's done pretty well for them. Well, Lenny, in a moment, we're going to continue with this political part of our discussion. And I'd also like to get your frank opinion of the following. President Eisenhower, and since you're a stock market expert, what kind of trend we can expect in the market next year? Spanking. Momism and Santa Claus. And we'll go after the answers to those questions in just 60 seconds. One look at this cabin cruiser, and you'd know it's new. One puff of this cigarette, 
And you know it's new. It's Philip Morris. And you know by the taste. Philip Morris tastes natural. And that's why smokers like it. And they like the man's kind of mildness in Philip Morris. No filter, no fooling. Nothing artificial between you and the tobacco itself. And the box. Here's something else smokers like. It's practical. Crush-proof. If you haven't smoked a Philip Morris lately, get with it. You'll find a natural taste, a man's kind of mildness, a crush-proof box. Get with Philip Morris. Probably the best natural smoke you ever tasted. Get with Philip Morris, pardon me, in regular pack or crush-proof box, a natural smoke with a man's kind of mildness. Lenny, before we get to those opinions, I understand that you'd like to run for office someday. Yes, I have a fear of being an unemployed office holder. An unemployed office holder? <laughs> yes. You mean uh, because you're a Democrat and because you're a Californian, you won't be able to be elected? Is that it? Or? Maybe because I'm a horrible speaker. Oh, I've never I made a good so. public speech, so. Uh, possibly because uh, Americans seem to have been wary of eggheads in the last few, last couple of elections, particularly it might be uh, tough for you to get elected. I'd be very flattered to be considered an egghead, but I don't think I've attained that. Lenny, what do you think of President Eisenhower? I don't know him personally, so I can't have an opinion of him as a person. But um, I think his attitude on many subjects has been more conservative than I'd like it to be, and that's why I, I hope a liberal Democrat would take off. Mm -hmm. Did you expect to have a strong president from President Eisenhower? Yes, I expected a, a very strong president because of his military uh, background, and I was quite surprised. This is only a personal reaction. Yes, you know. and disappointed, I gather. No. Not uh, disappointed. I expected an extra strong president, and uh, I think he's turned out to be a fairly mild president. I can't see anything wrong with it. With it or with him? Well, I, I mean, with mildness, I think, uh, I don't think it's particularly good or bad, but I'd rather have that than a, a strong president, which you, which I, anyway, usually associate with a military man. Well, wasn't Franklin Roosevelt a strong president? Yes. Did you disapprove from what you've read of Mr. Roosevelt? Uh, strength in a, a direction I approve is different than strength in the direction I disapprove. <laughs> and that, that accounts for the difference. I don't mind strength on the face of it under certain conditions. Lenny, have you ever been spanked? No. Never? What do you feel? Uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe when I was five. Mm -hmm. What do you think of spanking the children? I'm not a child psychologist. I have no idea. Uh, do you know what the term momism? Protective uh, mothers? Yes. Something like that? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I haven't read Mr. Wiley's book. Yes. Uh, I, I haven't had an experience with a protective mother. I see you there. Well, you can't beg off as having no opinion on this one. What can we expect of the stock market during 1958? These, day, uh, these days we hear about a mild recession, more than three million unemployed. Are we in for some tough times? Well, I have an opinion, all right, but it's a complete guess. And uh, I, my guesses have proved quite wrong in the past, and I'd rather not state it because it, it's uninformed. Well, I, I don't think. No no, I think. I think that w what you're uh, what you're saying now is reasonable. But no one is suggesting that you're an oracle, Lenny. We're simply asking for you, Leonard Ross's opinion as to what is going to happen to the market and the general economic tone of the country during 1958. You have uh, disavowed being an oracle, and we agree. Can we press you? No, I don't think you should, because uh, I I have a complete guess on it, and I don't want to be stopped a year from now and told how wrong I am, because I think I will be. And since it's a guess, and since I have no basis for guessing, I'd rather not make it public. You, you dislike intensely being wrong, do you? Uh, when, I, when I'm wrong on, a, on something which I've stated I could be right on, then I, I think this is bad for me, and I, I shouldn't have been wrong. Uh -huh. But when I'm wrong on something which I know nothing about and don't claim to know anything about, I can't see anything wrong in that. Two quick answers. Santa Claus. I'll wait until December 26th. And uh, 
Have you minded answering questions for free? Not at all. Leonard, I thank you so much for coming here from Tahunga, California, thank to you. spend this half hour with us. I hope it's been a pleasant few days for you here in New York. Please give my affection to your mother and father, and a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you and to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great temptation here to say something about out of the mouths of babes, but we won't. Let us simply say that Lenny Ross would seem to be a 12-year-old with the intelligence of an adult and still the fresh and enviable vision of a child. In just a moment, we'll bring you a rundown on next week's guest, a military prophet who believes our only chance for survival against Russia is to scrap our present military setup for a new one. First, if there are any pipe smokers watching, or if you know of one, here's a brief message about another fine Philip Morris product. If you'd like to introduce a pipe smoker to something new, just watch and see what Revelation has done. We've come up with a handy new pouch. And here it is. It's the newest, most convenient way to carry this perfect pipe mixture. Because here, you get tobacco and pouch all in one. So you can forget about tipping and spilling when you fill your pipe. Now you just do it in a jiffy. Because with Revelation's new pouch, you simply plunge the bowl of your pipe in as far as you like and fill her up. Fill her up with five great tobaccos, which are in Revelation. There's Choice Burley, Sparkling Carolina, Rich Perique, Spicy Latakia, and Sunny Virginia. You know, nothing smokes so good as Revelation. And say, if you're looking for a thoughtful gift, a most welcome one for any pipe smoker would be this one pound tin of Revelation in the colorful holiday package. And for day-to-day -day use, remember this handy new Revelation pouch. Next week, our guest will be a military prophet who says that war with Russia is almost inevitable within the next five years. And a frequent consultant to the War Department. If you're curious to know why, Major DeSevierski fears that one out of every three Americans will be killed in a Third World War. Why he charges that our present military setup must be junked immediately, and his opinions of the leadership being given us. We'll go after those stories next week. Till then, for Philip Morris, Mike Wallace, good night. The Mike Wallace interview is brought to you by Philip Morris, Incorporated. The Quality House.